brought to you by FPI, setting the standard. Yes, I mean, we, we finished off really, and I, you, you mentioned the meeting in Seoul. I know both of you have just come back from an FPSB uh, meeting from there. What are some of the key takeouts of that meeting? I think from a board perspective, it was the interaction that we had with Stephen Paul, the gentleman that Gerard just uh, referred to. Stephen's actually uh, uh, a Hong Kong regulator, and he sits on the Securities Committee of IOSCO. Mm. And um, the very fact that he was agreeable to fly out to Seoul to address our council, and what was even more interesting is that he was happy to wait and take part in our strat planning session and made very um, meaningful input. Um, it, 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 it reinforced our belief that um, professional bodies like ourselves have to work um, with regulators and work, work with reg regulators in ensuring that what happens is best for the consumer. Mm. And that seems to be the key principle around the globe at the moment, that um, it's, it's, it's not the regulators working against professional bodies or financial planners. We need to work together to, to create the kind of profession that we want to be proud of. Something you mentioned just now was, I mean, the introduction of FASAC, which is something that FPI very much endorsed and we're happy with. A <laughs> couple of nuances there that, that perhaps, you know, looking at more from a product perspective, but by and large, the FPI and the FSB, strong working relationship and, and, and certainly um, doing the collaboration that, that perhaps the Financial mm -hmm. Planning Standards Board is, is looking for at this stage. Absolutely. I'd, I'd echo what Prem says. I'd agree with you. We have that relationship with the FSB, for which we're very thankful. We have a similar relationship with the National Treasury, the Council for Medical Schemes, and all of those work towards the same goal of making sure that ultimately the consumers can rely on professional financial planning and professional advice. Um, definitely from my perspective, something also to mention that came out of the, the Seoul meeting as a final thing, it feels like something that's come out of a couple of meetings we've had over the last year and a, and a half or so, is the FPSB has released a discussion paper on the regulation of the profession. Mm. Now, that speaks to your point, Sean, around uh, the Phase Act speaking to regulation of product to some extent still. The thinking behind that discussion paper is that we must move towards regulating the profession, similar to what one might find for lawyers, accountants, doctors, as Prem mentioned earlier. It's a discussion paper full of principles, ideas, the thinking of the global community. As it stands, it won't work in every territory. Every territory is different. It definitely does in principle work for us as the, as the FPI. It is a question of how one localizes that and how you make sure that the timing is right around it and mm. that strategically for the industry it makes sense to, to regulate the, the financial planning profession. Uh, ultimately we take a view, the FPSB takes a view that one needs a, a strong relationship as Prem said with the regulator but one also needs some form of regulation of the profession. What it is we don't know yet, it's early days in, dis in discussions in South Africa but it's a discussion we have opened with both the policymaker and the regulator and that will be an ongoing discussion. Okay. Now, I mean, all, all of this has been on, on policy, on regulation, on the professional industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, sitting at the call face to actually interact with the consumer and client out there is the financial planner himself. Now, one of the things coming out of the discussion document as well is the potential of looking at protecting the term financial planner and trying mm -hmm. to ascribe some kind of... of, of, of um, level of expertise to that if you're going to be to be using that I mean that that's something that in principle sounds fantastic in in, th in theory or in practice might be a little bit more uh, difficult yeah uh, it actually is it actually is and 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 here we we look to the um, the, the Malaysia example mm -hmm. where financial planning has been regulated the word financial planner mm. and now um, you can only call yourself a financial planner if you are licensed with the Malaysian regulator, um, regardless of whether you're a CFP professional or not. So that is uh, something that we face and something that we need to be wary of as we go forward in our quest to, uh, to try regulate. And get it. Mm -hmm. So again, you're not going to have potential, well, ho hopefully in, in some time in the future, if we get it right, if you're dealing with a financial planner, you'll have a very, very strong idea of exactly who you are mm -hmm. dealing with. Speaking of which, I mean, we spoke about the custodian of the CFP mark, and it's certainly something that FPI drives a, a lot, is the mm -hmm. CFP trademark stands mm -hmm. for Certified Financial Planner or Certified Financial Practitioner. Um, 
Really, let's have a look. I mean, from a global perspective, there's 126,000 certified financial planners all sitting under the F FPSB standards. Locally, we've got somewhere in the region of 7,000. Um, so we've got somewhere in the region of about 3,800 mm -hmm. certified financial planners, of which approximately a third of them, so 12, 1,300 are, are potentially practicing. Mm -hmm. 1,200 individuals certified sitting under the body of the FPI. Um, certainly, that's within the reach of, of, of most people looking for, for proper financial planning advice. The FPI does also have more members. You mentioned the number 7,000. 7, yeah. So we've got two other categories of membership, which we very much view as a career path towards CFP, although people don't necessarily have to move up to CFP, but th that's our line of thinking on it. Financial planning is accessible, but not necessarily, I would suggest, to everybody in the country yet, mm. not by a long shot. We need to do a lot of work on that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also important to note that we're not 100% sure of how many of the CFP members are pra practicing members, not through lack of trying. It's difficult. People change careers and do different things. And also important to know is that some of those people work for large institu institutions and some of them are independent practitioners. One isn't better than the other. That's just important to note for consumers when they're out there and say, where do I find a CFP professional? You can go and knock on the door of one of the large product provider companies and find CFP professionals who abide by our codes of ethics and standards, follow our financial planning process. Definitely a lot of work still does need to be done. We've had uh, the fortunate position, we've been in the fortunate position to have a gentleman representing the Black Brokers Forum as one example on our board for some years. And we've done some good work with him, but a lot more can be done in that arena as well to take financial planning to the broader constituency within, mm -hmm. the, within the broader South Africa. I guess it's, it's really going to be a balancing act between trying to professionalize it, but then by the same token still keeping it accessible to, to those mm -hmm. that, that really, really need it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just talking, I mean, the, 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 probably the, the, the big criteria for a CFP is, is what they call the four E's, and it, it goes examination, education, experience, and, and, and ethics. Um, uh, firstly, for, for a CFP, you have to have a postgraduate diploma, but then there's actually a board exam that needs to be written as well, isn't there? There is a board exam, yes, so it's very similar to, one might say, the article process that a yeah. An accountant, a charter accountant might go through. So yes, one can write an exam, a postgraduate diploma. One could also go through some universities that offer BCom financial planning type degrees. Some universities are structured slightly different to others, in other words. And then after that, depending on which route you went, doesn't really matter. As long as the FBI approved that program, you can write the board exam. And obviously, as you mentioned, you also need a few years experience before you mm. can call yourself a CFP practitioner. Okay, and then of course, perhaps the fourth and, and, and for most consumers, the most important one, the, the fourth year of ethics. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that's something that's, that, that to my mind often is instilled in you or, or it isn't, it's very difficult to study it or train it or, mm -hmm. or learn it perhaps. But certainly FPI backing it up in terms of saying if you don't stand up to these code of ethics, then there are, uh, there are repercussions, there are consequences. I mean, could you outline what, what some of those might be? Absolutely. Uh, we've got a very, s a very strict code of conduct and a very strict disciplinary process that sits around that. So we've got a dedicated disciplinary <coughs> committee. <coughs> if any member of the public feels aggrieved because of an action of a, a member of the FPI, not necessarily a CFP, any member, they welcome to approach the FPI office. They'll call the committee into action. They'll review, um, have a hearing if need be. And work also closely with the FSB in that process. So mm. should we find someone mm. guilty, we'll alert the FSB. Also should we hear that uh, someone who's employed by a large uh, product provider has been found guilty through an internal process, we'll immediately alert the FSB and we'll immediately start our own investigation. Um, if one is found guilty by a professional body of misconduct, that immediately triggers an investigation at the FSB. And it can be a reason for the FSB to withdraw one's license. So this is a fairly big stick. Mm. Um, and it is important to us. Enforcement is particularly important. Otherwise, why have all the codes and all the Absolutely. rules? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, when you're looking at a certified financial planner, you're going to have somebody who's, who's educated, who's got experience, um, and, and has really, well, from an education, I guess the, the board exam comes into it as well, but mm -hmm. at the end of it, has to actually act in the interests of the clients. If not, you've got the FPI standing behind. Absolutely. And again, the collaboration we spoke about with the, the FPSB. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I, I, a quick question for both of you really to wrap up, and, and that is if, if you had a wish list, I mean, to have a look at this industry and say, if I could change one thing in this industry or see something change in the industry, what, what would that be, Bren? I would like to see it become a, 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 a truly well-respected profession. At the FPSB at the moment, we have Vision 2025, where we hope that this will be a distinct profession by that time. 
Kurt, from your point of view, would you concur with uh, what Prem said? Anything to add to that as well? I absolutely would. I'd just like to say it slightly differently as well. I'd like to see, I'd like to see matriculants leave school and say, I'd like to go and study and become a financial planner. I haven't heard anyone say that yet. Granted, I don't know that many 18-year-olds, but I'd like to hear that. I'd like to see that happen.